Let's talk through the Vola approach to the distal radius. Of course, 99 times out of 100, this will be done for uh, fixation of a distal radius factor that we would fix with a Vola locking plate. So if we're going to do this and get the most out of it, like anything, it's a little bit about planning and, of course, knowing the tips and tricks with regard to exposure of what you need in order to fix the fracture effectively. So let's start by talking about some uh, surface anatomy. Um, generally speaking, the arm will be, uh, the patient will be supine uh, and there'll be an arm table, an arm board, an extension from the side. I start to uh, think about how I would like the arm to be in relation to everything else. So this is at 90 degrees. Quite often I see uh, people sort of set this up with, with the arm slightly uh, obliquely and I think that that's really quite difficult because when the image intensifier comes in it's sometimes difficult to get um, the shot that you want in an orthogonal kind of way. We're orthopedic surgeons we like to see things either straight up or straight side to side. So I have this lying 90 degrees so the arm is abducted to 90 degrees and just make sure that the image intensifier as it comes in has got enough space. Obviously there's sometimes uh, uh, legs to the table and little things that can block the uh, passage of the image intensifier. Next Let's talk surface anatomy. Uh, the first obvious landmark is the tendon of flexor carpi radialis. It's sometimes quite difficult to feel, especially if uh, the wrist is particularly swollen. In this cadaver, it's not too bad. I can actually feel it running along here. If you're in any doubt, one really good, easily palpable landmark is the uh, scaphoid tubercle. Now, if you're still not sure where the scaphoid tubercle is, you would radially deviate the wrist and then start to feel the scaphoid flex. And I can feel that the scaphoid tubercle is there and the FCR tendon is gonna run past, past it just there. Again, if you're not really sure where the radius ends, another really useful anatomic landmark is the radial styloid. And you can pop your finger here on the radial border of the wrist, and quite often there's a very uh, well-defined um, uh, point where the uh, styloid tip can be felt. And I'm just gonna mark that for the sake of completeness here. Final landmark is if we begin to flex the wrist, we can start to have a think about where the distal wrist crease is. There are plenty of creases in this um, particular patient here, but I'm gonna mark out this uh, point here, which is the distal wrist crease. So now we've got a few landmarks that we can base an incision on. Of course, we're gonna come along the um, FCR tendon, and that's right there. Now, if you imagine that the styloid is here, often we need to get this volar ulna fragment exposed. So in order to reach this ulna side, we really have to extend the incision distally. The more distal we go, the more we can retract ulnaward in order for exposure of that ulna side of the radius. So sometimes it's necessary to extend the incision up to or even beyond the level of the uh, wrist crease. So we can start to base an incision now around the uh, distal wrist crease and the um, scaphoid tubercle. So here on this particular uh, uh, on this occasion, I could come all the way up to here before you reach the wrist crease. And if we need to go to it, we can do a little zigzag up and down across like that. Sometimes depending on the uh, location of the scaphoid tubercle, this can be incorporated into the apex just here. But you can see that now we have gone well above the level of the styloid. We'll be able to expose all of this in an ulnar fashion, okay? So I'm gonna make this incision uh, longer than I ordinarily would but it'll give us a really good idea of uh, how far up and down we can go.
So at this stage, the next step is obviously exposure of the FCR tendon. Sometimes there are some superficial veins here, and I take a, uh, a fairly um, meticulous view on diatherming these. Lots of these operations are done on a day case basis, and these veins look quite small under uh, a tourniquet, but if you do cut them, they can bleed afterwards and cause quite a significant hematoma if left unattended. So I'm just going to put you in there with a cat's paw, and then I'm just going to pull this back a little here, and we're going to start to expose the tendon of FCR, which is just coming into view here. Sometimes, again, distally, there are some small vessels that I buzz. So here is the tendon of our FCR. I don't go crazy with the exposure of the uh, tendon. I don't necessarily always uh, open the sheath. I quite like to leave the sheath intact because, especially in uh, a case where there isn't a great deal of subcutaneous fat, exposure of the white collagen just, um, I think, promotes adherence of the collagen and scar tissue formation and adhesions to the superficial skin layers. So I grab the tendon here and I just pull it to one side and that just allows me to expose the bed of FCR a little bit more effectively. Now, of course, just on the radial border, you have got on your side the radial artery. Again, I don't really go looking for trouble. I know that it's there. I know it's just under your retractor and you're just in the skin and no deeper. But I can pop in here and start to develop that plane. Do you see that pocket? From here on my side, on the ulnar side, is the FCR. And there, just coming in underneath us, is the beginnings of the uh, radial artery. And of course, here now, this is the bed of FCR. I'm going to pull it towards me. You're in the pocket. And I'm just going to extend that on my side. I've got tension. I'm pulling the FCR towards me. And there I am going through the bed of FCR. And you have got the uh, radial artery and the vessels on your side of the wound. Let's start to develop that a little bit more distally. And once again, we just have to be careful as we come distally because there is or there are traversing vessels that come from the radial artery onto the ulnar side. And again, if we see some superficial ones, we can coagulate them. Now, as we start to drift distally, what we also start to see is the emergence of transverse fibers. These transverse fibers, we can just see a few of here. And we'll see them as we go all the way down. There is a, uh, a sheath of transverse fibers. And we can safely divide these so long as there's no uh, vessels that we've identified crossing them. And this allows us to continue our deeper dissection. Do you see these transverse fibers here? It is safe. So there is the vessel. Remember that the vessel will be creeping back into your surgical field. So if you're overzealous with your knife here, you do run the risk of injuring the vessel. So you do have to be careful. I'm just going to make my exposure a little bit better defined here distally. Make sure that the vessel remains over on your side there, Pete. Here are the transverse fibers, and I know I'm safe in this transverse zone. And there are those fibers. They're very, very well defined. They are quite thick often, but we can divide them. And that will bring us down onto the deeper layer. So the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm just going to get my finger in and sweep along the radial border of the radius. And that's going to do two things. The first thing that it will allow me to do is to expose and break down some of the fibers of flexor pollicis longus. And if you're in any doubt as to where FPL is, you can, of course, flex and extend the thumb and that will move the muscle identifying it. So I'm going to sweep all the way down and then start to sweep across. So the second thing that this maneuver will allow me to do is to expose the fibers of pronator quadratus, which lies behind us or uh, deep to us. So there we go. FPL is kind of pushed out of the way, swept out of the way. And here underneath, we now have uh, exposure of the uh, pronator. So here, what, what you'll see, Pete, is that there's all of this um, fibro fatty stuff that seems to be obscuring the distal part of the uh, exposure. We can definitely see our PQ, but then it's difficult to see what lies up here. 
And actually, we probably need to expose some of this because we want to get to the distal margin of PQ. I want to see where the pronator quadratus starts to become more tendinous and attached to the watershed of the distal radius because it's there that we're going to make our tenotomy to allow for the exposure. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my knife and I'm just gently going to start to divide this until it starts to come into view. And just by making that little incision into that fibro fatty layer, it allows some better exposure. At this stage, I'm also going to grab a swab. And just by sweeping that upwards, we can start to see a little bit more of the underlying muscle. And if I could get you to come into there, I'm actually going to take my knife and I'm going to flatten the knife. And again, I'm just gently going to sweep all the way across. Now, what I'm feeling for here is what's sometimes referred to as the volar tubercle of the distal radius. So here, there is a raised prominence on the radial side of the radius. And that raised prominence is probably a, uh, the most reliable uh, way of identifying the fossa in which your plate sits. So you really don't want to sit your plate any more radial or any more distal than that prominence. And once you have found it, just distal to it will be the white tenderness portion of the insertion of the uh, pronator. So I'm just going to come in the other direction now. Again, we've got this flim flammy uh, fibro fatty stuff, and I'm just gently going to sweep that away with a knife and then sweep that away again with a swab. And so now, if we take a look inside, we can see the whole of the pronator. And now we've got a really clear view of where the pronator muscle stops and where the tenderness portion attaches to the rim of the radius. And of course, this is our watershed line. This is where the uh, plate really needs to uh, sit behind or more proximal to. Let's come onto the radial side of the joint now, and I'll show you how to expose the um, uh, brachial radialis. Now, in a distal radius fracture, if there's been shortening of the radius, sometimes we want to expose the brachial radialis, divide the brachial radialis, because that's going to be something that's holding our reduction back. We want to be able to restore the length of the radius, and by detaching the brachial radialis from its distal insertion, it will facilitate that. One of the first things that I do is I take my scissors and I fall onto the radial border of the radius. I can feel the bone and I'm just going to push in and then spread and make a pocket. And into that pocket, I'm going to put in a blunt Hohmann retractor like so. So you could come out there and you could come out there. Now, basically what that does is it starts to separate the radius from its immediate attachments. Now, sometimes it falls beneath the brachial radialis, i.e. right on top of the bone, and sometimes the brachial radialis is just on the other side of it. So let's see where it's fallen on this particular occasion. Now here, I think that I have fallen right onto the bone, and I think that this is the tendon of brachial radialis just behind me. So do you see that the tendon of brachial radialis distally is very flat, and it's quite broad? Do you see it here, Pete? Do you see it's really well defined? And actually, I might just get, yeah, that's a really nice exposure. So here, we can trace it distally, should we wish to. And let's see if we can identify where it actually inserts and attaches onto the radius. Now, it is sometimes possible to get it wrong and to mistake the tendon of brachial radialis for the tendons of the first extensor compartment because they are just behind us. And of course, we don't want to be cutting APL and we do not want to be cutting EPB. Now, those tendons are actually still more dorsal still. So if I was to continue this dissection in a more dorsal fashion, if I was to pick up my BR, go behind and expose up here, I would eventually find the tendons that we do not want to cut, and there they are.
See them there? And these are the tendons of the first extensor compartment. They are not broad. They are not flat. They are much more reliably tendinous. And again, if we pull on them, they will cause a contraction uh, more distally. So here we are. Let's go back to our brachioradialis. And I know that it's brachioradialis because if I pull on it, nothing really happens because it's attached just ever so slightly more distally to the radius. If I want to, I can just divide the uh, BR. You could come out there, Pete. That's good. Now, if for any reason you wish to do a repair of your brachioradialis afterwards, you can actually do a step cut. So in a younger patient, if I want to do a BR repair, especially in an athlete, I might come in longitudinally and make a split and go down one side. Down the other. Then I can lengthen my radius and then do a BR repair with a little bit of lengthening if needed. OK. Next, let's continue with the exposure of the radius itself. I really don't ever use a self-retaining retractor. Sometimes the teeth are really super sharp and they're not really designed for a wound such as this. I'm also a little bit paranoid because just on your side of the retractor, there is the radial artery and vein. And just to the side of us here is, of course, the median nerve. And we know where the flexor carpi radialis is because we have uh, identified it in the superficial part of the wound. But just ulnar to us is the tendon of palmaris longus. Now, between the two is the um, median nerve. And effectively, just more or less beneath palmaris is the median nerve. And there is a variability in uh, the uh, anatomy of the palmocutaneous nerve as it comes off, but predominantly it's on the radial border of the median nerve. So you're really never far away from it. And if you put this guy in and you're having to adjust this 100 times during the course of the operation, there's a good chance that one of these teeth is either going to go into the median nerve, to the palmocutaneous branch, or into the radial artery. So I tend not to use it. So you've got one there. I'm going to ask you to swap your hands and put the other one in here. And I'm going to sweep this away again. Sometimes if I need to get more exposure distally, I can pull this back again here, make another distal pocket just on the radial border of the radius again here. And then I can put this again distally. And I can place you again here. Good. And then again, we have a really nice exposure of all of the pronator and the tendinous portion. So let's now expose the distal radius. Starting proximally, I feel for the radius with the knife. There's nothing really there in the way any longer. All of the important stuff has been moved. And then I cut down onto the radius, sharp dissection. And I expose proximally and start to mobilize that pronator. Pronator has um, a great deal of variability. Obviously, sometimes it's really flimsy muscle and it's been quite badly uh, injured as a result of the fracture. But on many occasions, it still remains intact and it's perfectly feasible to elevate the whole thing as a single layer with a view to repair at the end if at all possible. Now, there's been a lot of discussion over the years as to whether you need to repair it or not. But from my perspective, I think that it's a good idea to cover the plate if at all possible and just put a, a layer of soft tissue between the plate and the FPL and the FDP to the index, which is a little bit more ulnarward. So I've come along this border here, and I'm definitely now on the radial border of the radius. I've come up to that tubercle, that little prominence now, and now I'm looking for the area where that becomes more like a tendon and whiter. And we can see that really quite clearly. I'm just going to mark it out. Muscle, tendon, tubercle. And I'm just going to make a little L-shaped tenotomy here. You don't want to go too distal because obviously then you'll be into the wrist joint. 
but you want to leave a little cuff to repair back onto. Now, once I've got this started, I take my other homan, I come under the pronator, I fall into that little gutter between the radius and ulna, that gets exposed further. I'm just going to put this a bit more distal here, Pete. I think that's as far as it wants to go. I'm going to sweep a little bit further again with my swab. And now we've got a pretty good view here. And so we can start to see what is arguably the most important part of the radius for the purposes of fixing a fracture, which is this volar ulna corner. And with a teeny bit more exposure here with a knife, you will see that there is um, a really nice exposure of that very most ulna portion of the radius, which is just there. So when I'm fixing a difficult fracture that's really, really distal, I want to be able to see the entirety of the radius, the entirety of the fracture, and now that's a, um, a pretty comprehensive view. Here is that fossa that I was telling you about before. That Remember we were talking about that tubercle, for want of a better description, that raised prominence here? The plate is going to sit no higher up than that, no more radial than that. So this is a really good landmark. And of course, that fragment that we were talking about is here. This is the one that we want to get our screw into. And of course, we've got a really nice view all the way down onto the radial shaft. And of course, you can extend this more proximally, uh, should you wish, in order to get a slightly longer plate on. But that is the exposure to the volar side of the radius.